Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 62, brought to you by the one and only, the legendary Black Belt Magazine. And I am extremely excited. I feel like I say that every week that we have a guest because our guests just keep getting better and better. We have the man, the myth, the legend himself, Richard Plowden is on the show today. Uh, so honored to have you on the show, sir. And first things first, go ahead, introduce yourself to our Black Belt Magazine audience. We're going to get into coaching Team Impex. We're going to get into being president of WKC USA. We're even going to get into your career as an all-time great point fighter yourself. But take us all the way back. Where did this journey start for you? Well, first, I have to say, Jackson, thank you very much for having me on the show. I saw the shirt and I thought you were talking about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's funny. But um, I started my martial arts training. Um, I can remember the exact date, October 27th, 1973. What had occurred was my brother was a manager of a bank here in Detroit. And one of the bank customers happened to be the owner of a Taekwondo school. So my, my brother came home and he told my dad, hey, I'm going to start taking martial arts lessons. My dad pointed at me and said, take him with you. So, you know, I was 13. My brother, I think at the time was like 22. He wasn't real excited about taking his teenage brother with him to do something that was so cool because back then, you know, that was the Bruce Lee era. People were joining martial arts schools, watching the Bruce Lee movies, watching the other Kung Fu movies and things. So it was a real exciting time. Um, at 13, I happened to be one of the youngest ones though in my instructor school. And, you know, I, I, I loved it. I thought I was doing awesome. Found out later that my instructor told my brother, hey, you're doing okay, but with Richard, you're wasting your money. <laughs> and um, my, my brother came home and gleefully told that to my dad. My father said, nope, we're gonna keep him in it. And believe it or not, um, at that, in that Taekwondo school, and I still consider Wan Chick Park my instructor, uh, I got my black belt in 18 months. But it was it, it was an addiction back then, you know. Um, I was in middle school at thirteen, and then even when I went to high school, once I had gotten my black belt, my instructor gave me a key, so I would go to right to the uh, Taekwondo school, do my homework and things, and then work out. So you know, it just everything just kind of went from there. At this time, there's seven of us Plowdens that are black belts, so you know, my my brother deciding to take martial arts lessons really opened up a ton of doors for us. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I think that so many of our audience that are black belts that are lifetime martial artists can relate to that passion. Like the, the minute that you walked in the door, you fell in love with martial arts. Um, but what not many people can relate to is that level of work ethic, right? And I think that level of work ethic is what allowed you to become a world champion and a great point fighter in your own right. Uh, and also being such a student of the game is what has made you an excellent coach. But let's start with your career as a competitor. Take us back and tell us about what it was like point fighting back then and, and some of your favorite experiences fighting in that era. Well, I fought in my first uh, tournament as a black belt in 1975, I was 15. And my instructor entered me into this event that was um, here in Detroit, it was a major thing, it was held at Cobo Arena here, which was our big sports arena. And um, again, the whole Bruce Lee era. So Jim Kelly was a special guest there and so on and so forth. And somehow, to this day, I don't know how, I took second place. I lost to a guy from Detroit named Larry Logan. And that year, Larry had won the super lightweight division at the Battle of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I lost to Larry and then for two years, any tournament I entered, I lost. I might win my first fight and lose my second fight. And that went on, that, that went on for two years. It was somewhat frustrating, but um, in the school, I knew I was, I was doing well. I was working hard, you know, um, I was sparring with some of the guys who were winning some events and doing well. And, um, you know, as, as you just said, it's a matter of work ethic. So I loved it, you know, and it wasn't the winning that was, that was so supreme for me. It was just being able to compete, being able to do it. So then April 24th, 1977, I could, again, I, I can't remember my wife's birthday, but I can remember martial arts dates, right? <laughs> April 24th, 1977, I won my first grand championship. May 1st, 1977 in Chicago, I won my second grand championship. And then from there, things just kind of started to, to take off. But you know, you have the black belt emblem behind you, Black Belt Magazine and Karate Illustrated Magazine were part of my motivating factors. I wanted to be in the magazine. 
I saw Howard Jackson, Jeff Smith, you know, these guys in the magazines and I wanted to go where they were. You know, I wanted to be like them. So once I started winning tournaments here in the Midwest in Detroit and Chicago, I thought, wow, you know, let me see, let me find out how I can go further with this. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And uh, definitely a great shout out for Black Belt Magazine there. And for anybody interested in some of those like legendary fighters from sport karate history, kickboxing history and everything in between, uh, Black Belt actually recently launched the full complete Hall of Fame online for the very first time. So if you head on over to blackbeltmag.com after this podcast is over, uh, or if you just scroll down through our Facebook, you'll find the link for it. But blackbeltmag.com, click on the sidebar menu. You're going to go down to Hall of Fame, click the drop down and hit member profiles. And you can see from 1968 all the way through 2020, everybody that's ever been inducted to the Hall of Fame. Uh, and in my opinion, somebody that's probably a snub from that list is Richard Plowden because he, he is of the caliber as a competitor, as a coach, as the president of WKC USA to belong in that group of martial artists. But I digress. Thank uh, you, so, <laughs> but I, and I want to say this too, as part of that motivation, you mentioned um, the, the Black Belt Hall of Fame. There's a gentleman from here in Michigan, Ernie Lee, who, um, you know, Ernie was the man of the year in 69 or 70. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the motivation too, just being able to interact with him and knowing how much esteem he had in the martial arts community as a result of being um, a man of the year for Black Belt. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And so now I want to dive back into your story a little bit. So you mentioned that you started in a, in a Taekwondo program. When you started off competing in tournaments, getting that first win, the first grand championship, would you say that early on, did you have more of like a, a Taekwondo, like what we would say in like Olympic Taekwondo back then? Did you have that kind of style or was that kind of separate and you, you developed a point fighting style? It, it, I, I was definitely 110% Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. You know, it was um, the, 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 the whole back leg kicks, no punching to the faces, no back fist, that whole genre was what I was part of, mm -hmm. um, even though, again, I was inspired by what I was reading in the magazines. But what happened was in 1978, well, let me back up a little bit. One of my instructor students in Korea was a gentleman from Texas named Roy Kerbin, mm -hmm. right? And, and Mr. Kerbin is a, is a legendary martial artist, so on and so forth, had a big event, big open event that was a Karate Illustrated A-rated tournament called the uh, Fort Worth Pro-Am. So Mr. Kerbin and, and my instructor hooked back up when well, my instructor came here in 72 um, from Korea and they started forging a, a relationship or deepening their relationship. So here in Detroit, um, my instructor worked in the auto plant in addition to running the school. So Mr. Kerbin convinced him that Fort Worth, Texas was growing. You come and you move to Texas and you can just do Taekwondo full time, so on and so forth. So in 1978, my instructor made the decision to move to Texas, which broke my heart. I mean, literally when I found out, and it's funny, he has a young daughter and his daughter was the one to tell me that they were moving to Texas. He didn't get a chance to. And, and I, was, I was devastated, I was destroyed. But now looking back, that was the, one of the best things that happened for me because it got me out of the whole Taekwondo realm and it helped to introduce me to the open tournaments. So at that same time, I went to school at a, at a, at a university called Grand Valley State that was three hours away from here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they did more of an open point style of competing and fighting. So um, I go there and there were two guys that I started working out there with who were students of Ernie Lee, um, guy Fred Reinecke and David Hayes. And they told me about this tournament that was coming up called the AK Grand Nationals in Chicago. Mm. And they told me, hey, it's this tournament coming up, AK Grand Nationals, a lot of the top competitors will be there. You know, you should, you should really go. So this, this was now 1979. So me and a couple of my classmates, we go to uh, the 79 AK Grand Nationals. And again, somehow, I don't know how, I wind up fighting for first place, I fought a guy named Matt Jaggers, who at that point in time, the year before, was runner up to Keith Vitale at the Diamond Nationals. Right, so I beat Matt, Matt, Matt Jaggers for um, first place. And then back then Karate Illustrated had a top 10. Mm -hmm. So in my semifinal match for the grand championship, I fought a gentleman named Steve Fisher, who was rated number five in Karate Illustrated at that time. And I beat Steve, I shut him out. So then, you know, folks are paying attention. And then Scorpion Barrage, Chicago's great Scorpion Barrage, 
whip my behind for the grand championship. <laughs> Score put it on me. But, you know, I got some fuel from that. And at that, at that time, Renardo Barton was the editor of Karate Illustrated and Renardo was there and he took an interest in me. He was this young, young kid we've never seen before, so on and so forth. So, you know, he gave me a nice little write up in the mat in Karate Illustrated um, as, as this unknown and every, everything just really took off from there. Right. That's so cool. And then as, as many people who watch this podcast know that I'm a complete sport karate history there. You mentioned that Diamond Nationals that Keith Vitale won. That was the first recorded Diamond Ring win in Diamond Nationals history. And that's one thing that I love about the Diamonds is that they're the only tournament that has a public record of everybody who's ever won the ring dating all the way back to the early 70s, which I think is just like the coolest thing in the world. But yeah, that's, anyway, that's so cool that. And speaking of having great histories at specific tournaments, you mentioned going to the AKA Grand Nationals. I would be willing to bet a lot of money that the Plowden family has amassed more Warrior Cups than any other family in the history of that tournament. What is what is the Warrior Cup count up to there? Um, I think we have, how many do we have here? Avery has three, Morgan has five, I have two. So, you know, we, 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 <laughs> we have quite a few here. That's a pretty we, decent but, but, collection. But, but, but listen, you understand, how many do you have? <laughs> I, I got seven myself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So you know, but that that is a wonderful trophy, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's the you best know, in the sport. Again, Keith Vitale was the first one to win the diamond. He was the first one to win a Warrior Cup, right? Yeah, I didn't know and, that. And, and the year that he won the Warrior Cup, it was supposed to be given out if somebody could win it two years in a row. Hmm. But after Keith won it, John Sharkey decided, no, we're going to go ahead and we're going to give it to each each grand champion. So he won it, then um, John Jackson won it the next year, then I won it the third year. That's awesome, very cool. So now speaking of some of those big wins, let's go ahead. I want you to brag a little bit because you deserve it. What are some of maybe two, three, what are your favorite career wins? What are those moments where you realize that you were one of the best in the world or the best in the world at the time? What are some of those big highlight wins for you? Well, you know, as, as, you, as you are, you know, I've always been um, a student of sport karate history. So for me, I, I, I never really considered myself the best in the world, but there were some days that I had that were wonderful. Um, the one that sticks out the most uh, right away is we used to have what was called the Atlantic Grand Slam, where um, the, the owner of the Atlantic Oil Companies, John Doyce, gave away $40,000 cash at each one of these Grand Slam events. So um, each grand champion got $5,000. Um, there was runner up money. If you won first place in your division, you got 750. Second place was 500, third place was 300. And for us fighters, it was a double elimination tournament. So the Grand Slam event in New York City in 1987, I beat Billy Blanks, Mafia Holloway, and Steve Nassie Anderson each twice to win that money. So, you know, to pull that off in a double elimination tournament and beat those three all-time greats two times was, th that, that was amazing. So that stands at the top as far as, my, um, as far as my most significant wins. And then winning diamonds in, in 92, um, winning two AKA Warrior Cups. And then also in 95, I won, um, I won Waco. So winning, winning, winning the gold medal in Waco because it, uh, you know everything comes together, right? Right. So you win and win different events, different genres and things, and that that plays a huge role. That is insane, especially that story about that Grand Slam tournament. By the way, can, can we get back to that forty grand in prize money? That'd be great. But I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I gotta ask because you talk about that that gauntlet of all time great fighters. Who gave you the toughest fight? Who, who was it that was the hardest for you to beat of some of those big names? He's easy. Steve Nassie Anderson. Mm -hmm. Steve, um, may he rest in peace. Uh, Steve was the kind of guy who would do anything to win, Jackson. Mm -hmm. And he didn't mind telling you that, right? <laughs> he, would, he would do anything to win. There are um, stories of him calling up opponents at 3 o'clock in the morning and telling them what he was going to do to their wives after he beat them. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, since I have a litany of Steve Nasty Anderson stories, but what Steve Anderson and Billy Blanks did in the mid 1980s was made us go from just being dojo trained individuals to being athletes. 
So, you know, we had to start lifting. We had to start running because they, they paved the way. They showed us that. And in order, to beat, in order to beat them, we had to go to that level. So Steve Addison, Billy Blanks, Anthony Price. Anthony Price was difficult because he was long, fast, and smart, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, those guys, one thing that's a difference between what we have today and what we have in my era, and I don't want to be that old guy that says, you know, well, we were so much better, this, that, and the other, but our divisions were deep. Mm -hmm. I can remember Battle of Atlantis with 50 guys in each division. We had five then in each division. So they'd have to divide them into two ranks. And then, you know, the individuals from each ring would come and fight for first place. So that's what made things different. Now, since we have MMA, you don't have the same number of individuals who play points and then go and do uh, MMA also. Back then, we had guys like Robert Harris, you know, Rick Rufus, um, John Longstreet. They did tournaments and they did full contact. Mm. So, you know, I, I mentioned John Jackson. I fought John Jackson a couple of times. 6'5", 230 pounds, PK, U.S. heavyweight champion, and he come to tournaments and play. So we had that kind of crossover. We don't have that crossover now. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And you mentioned, you know, not just MMA, but there's so many combat sports out there now that when people come into a martial arts school, it's always like that martial arts school is going to have like the one combat sport that they train for, right? Whether that be the Olympic Taekwondo and focus on going to the Olympics or whether it's WKF Kumite or you might wind up doing BJJ, you know what I mean? So there's so many different combat sports, whereas back in the day, that sport karate was one of the biggest ones. It was because of coverage from Karate Illustrated and sport karate could give you opportunities to get full contact fights and things of that nature. So that's a really interesting dynamic. But when we get into the actual play of the game, so to speak, right? What would you say is, is one or two of the biggest differences in the way that point fighting looks today compared to how it was back in your era? Well, today's, um, today's athletes are much more athletic. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, I can remember in the 70s, guys smoking in between matches. You know, um, the, the, the matches were only to three points. Then we went to five points. So the level of conditioning wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. Now, now today's athletes have to be much more conditioned. They're definitely uh, much flashier. They can pull things off that we didn't even comprehend, we didn't even think about. So, you know, those, those are, are a couple of the major differences. One thing that I would like to see changed though, is the two point body kick. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that the two point body kick um, should go much like back in the seventies, we had groin techniques and mm -hmm. we evolved to get rid of um, kicks to the groin and strikes to the groin. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a constant evolution. Right. Absolutely. And I've heard that from a bunch of fighters. I think even when, when Avery was on the show, I think we talked about it. I know that we talked about it when I had Ross Levine on the show and Ross Levine known for his defensive sidekick could kill three men with that defensive sidekick. Right. And he says, give me one point for it. I, I don't want two points for that. You know, so it, it's interesting to hear so many fighters, even fighters who are a major part of their game is the defensive sidekick to say, Hey, kick to the body. That should be one point. So elaborate that, elaborate on that a little bit for our audience that, that may not know, well, why does it matter? Two points to the body, one point. Like what, what difference does it make in the grand scheme of the fight? So can you just elaborate a bit on why that should be one point instead of two points like it currently is under NASCAR rules? Yeah, and, and, and to be honest with you, NASCAR is the only major circuit now that still has a two-point body kick. But, you know, the skill level, we have to admit, the skill level that it takes to kick somebody in this little puny head, you know, it, ta it, ta it takes some skill to do that, whereas the body is a much larger target. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And then for me, who um, helped make my reputation on throwing a body punch or a reverse punch, to be able to navigate my way in and be able to score with a, with a reverse punch, take some skills, give me two points for that, <laughs> you know? So it, it, it's, it's just, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, of approach. And I just think that degree of difficulty. You know, the degree of difficulty associated with kicking someone in the head, that should be rewarded. Mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting. You mentioned, you know, the, the reverse punch to the body compared to the defensive sidekick. And I, I have to imagine that a lot of fighters would agree 
it's harder to land the reverse punch than it is to land the defensive sidekick. You see the defensive sidekick land more often, at least, unless you have fighters that are predominantly reverse punchers, in which case you're going to see a lot of reverse punching, right? So I think that a lot of fighters would agree that the reverse punch is the more difficult technique to score with. Anybody that's watching, fighters that are watching, go ahead and comment about that. I'd love to see some discussion about that uh, down in the comments during this stream. So go ahead and post that in the comments, then maybe we can look at those and respond to those uh, after we get finished with the show and everything. But yes, that, that's absolutely an interesting perspective. Go ahead. Did you, want, did you have something to say? Three three things to score a point, right? Timing, distance, technique. The distance element associated with being able to launch a strong reverse punch is different than it is to launch a, a body kick because a lot of people kick to stay safe, right? Mm -hmm. Stay away, stay away, stay away. They're not really trying to hit you, but they just want you to stay away. Whereas to be able to navigate your way in to step back and slam somebody in the ribs with a good reverse punch, that takes real intent. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So one quick thing before we move on, because the next thing we're going to talk about is how you have the ability to, to edit some of those rules and make the sport better through your position as president of WKC USA. Before we get to that, you know, we mentioned, obviously, anybody that has watched the tape, anybody that knows about Richard Plowden fighting is that the reverse punch is a trademark of yours, right? So being somebody that came from a Taekwondo background, I know that you mentioned training at the more point karate based school later on after your instructor moved. At what point did that reverse punch become the, the signature move of your game? How did that happen for a Taekwondo guy who typically doesn't punch very much? I don't know if you did some, some, some study on this, Jackson, or you just asked this question organically, but that's a great question. Um, what happened was um, 1980, I go to my first Diamond Nationals and I didn't know anyone, you know, so I'm sitting in the lobby, um, young guy, and um, there's a guy named Mike Geneva from South Carolina. Mike at that time was the top light heavyweight in the country, best friend of the number one fighter in the country, Keith Vitale. And Mike saw me sitting there and he said, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm just, just chilling. He said, come on and come with me. And he and I went into downtown Minneapolis and just hung out, didn't know him. Don't know how this even occurred. But here I am sitting with a guy that's been all over the magazine, so on and so forth. And he and I started talking. He said, well, listen, this, this, this changed everything. He said, you're a heavyweight. In order to be successful in this sport and be a heavyweight, you have to have a reverse punch. And it resonated, right? So I went back to school, went back to Grand Valley, and I would train there in um, the combatives room, the, the, the wrestling room, and I put a newspaper over the window so I could see my reflection. And I started practicing reverse punch. Really didn't know what the heck I was doing, right? But I just, I just started trying to drill it, trying to drill it, trying to drill it. And then being such a huge fan of the game, I started watching other people and I became a mimic, mm -hmm. right? So you sat back, you say, okay, that works. That doesn't work. And then I come back, try it on my students, you know, and it would build from there. But I, I, I say wholeheartedly that Mike Jennifer sitting in Minnesota in 1980 changed the game for me. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. And, and I'm, I'm geeking out a little bit right now. So audience, forgive me, but I, I want to go down this rabbit hole a little bit more. So in today's game, when we see the reverse punch, you talk about needing to get the distance right and everything. Most of the time when we see the reverse punch, it's a counter to the back fist, right? Somebody's coming over the top with the back fist and it's this high block reverse punch type technique that gets thrown. Was it the same back then? Was it just a, a defense for the back fist? And every time there was a back fist that would work, or what was your favorite um, I guess, opportunity to throw it. When, what were you looking for in the fight to land that reverse punch? How individuals reacted particularly to fakes. Mm -hmm. And again, having, um, having Billy Blanks and Steve Anderson, who are also masterful, masterful mm -hmm. reverse punches, having them around um, and being able to watch them eventually be on the team with them and have them help correct some things help with the growth as well so no it wasn't just a defense reverse but just a matter of being able to sit back and throw fake shift and then go mm -hmm. right um you always have to watch how individuals react to different things that's what uh will get me upset with young people who are fighting in a division and they lose and they walk away they don't stay and watch you have to study mm -hmm. right because people we're all creatures of habit so we all do things you know a, a lot of us 
we get scored on with something and we come right back with the same technique all of the time. People mm -hmm. don't pay attention to that. So I try to tell my people, okay, when this person gets scored on, this is what they're gonna retaliate with. So, you know, they, you, you, you know in your head, you're processing things. So relationship with that, with, with the reverse punch, I can remember, um, and, and again, man, I'm, I'm so messed up. I, I can just remember <laughs> times and places. I'm, I'm, um, we're, we're on a team together. I'm on a team with uh, Billy Blanks, Steve Anderson, and Billy and I are in St. Louis and we're talking, right? And we're talking techniques. And Billy told me, he said, Richard, when you throw your reverse punch, you're lifting your front foot first and then you're punching. He said, so when Steve and I see you lift your front foot, we throw our punch first. So if nothing else, we're gonna hit at the same time, what we call a clash, we're gonna hit at the same time. So what you need to do is be able to push off your back leg and launch the punch. Again, advice from a, from, from, from a competitor or a friend that changed the game for me. Absolutely, so, so cool, so interesting. But now we're gonna move on because I could talk about that forever and dive into point fighting strategies and we'd be here for three hours. But anyway, so now moving on to one of your current roles as the president of WKC USA. WKC, for those of you that don't know that are watching is the World Karate Commission. They are a sport karate league that hosts an annual world championships. So first, Mr. Plowden, if you could just tell us a little bit of what you do as president uh, of the United States portion of WKC. Well, I'll tell you this, um, 11 years ago, I got a phone call from Mike Bernardo and John Dugers um, telling me that they were leaving another world, world body and they were gonna start their own um, and they wanted me to represent the United States and put together a, a team for the United States. And I was elated. You know, one, John and Mike are uh, Canadian legends. Oh yeah. When it, comes, when it comes down to sport karate, John, both of them have a multitude of schools and they're, they're extremely smart people, but they're passionate about sport karate. Unfortunately for me, you have a lot of uh, school owners who don't embrace uh, sport karate. They don't embrace the tournament side. And that's unfortunate because I think all of them will have A and B students that could, can excel. You know, you have some students that will never get it, but you have A and B students who can excel, who might wind up going to soccer, they might wind up going to volleyball, they go to other sports, as opposed to us encouraging and, and getting them to embrace what we're doing as far as sport karate goes. So Mike and John called me and um, offered me this opportunity. And right away, Jackson, again, like yourself, being a student of the game, I knew the kind of format that AAU Taekwondo and AAU Karate had, as far as having qualifiers, leading to a national championship. And then for us, it would lead to a world championship. So I had some people at first tell me, no, just do a national and then go to the world and so on and so forth. And I said, well, no, if this is something we really want to build, we need, a, we need an infrastructure, right? We need something that's going to make people want to be part of it, not part of a circuit, but part of a movement. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've been able to do over the last 10 years, you know, you have some people that will tell you they love WKC. They like our uniforms, they like our hoodies, this, that, and the other. And it's, it's a matter of creating a culture. So I wanted to have something that leading to a, a legitimate outcome. Now, being transparent, I was heavily involved at one point in time with the NBL. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I think that in some respects, Boyce Lydell was a genius. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I say that without question. In other respects though, you know, sometimes we can sabotage ourselves. But to have a series of tournaments leading to a major championship is what most sports do. Mm -hmm. So um, in getting involved with WKC USA, it gave me an opportunity to do that as well as empower different promoters to have a little bit more of a draw for mm -hmm. people to want to come to their tournament because they're gonna be able to qualify for uh, the WKC USA Nationals and then go to the world where we have this, uh, the, the, this level of competition between Canada, England, the United States, because the major draw that with, with WKC, I think at the end of the day happens to be our team fight. And that country versus country team fighting, Jackson, how, how passionate the people are. You know, it's one thing to go to a tournament and you have 20 or 30 people from your school cheering for, for you. It's another thing to go to an event and you have a few hundred of your country chanting USA, USA. It's an adrenaline rush 
unlike any other. So there's a guy, um, are you a professional wrestling fan at all? Uh, I, I know a little bit of it, but. There's a guy named Eric Bischoff. Mm -hmm. Eric used to compete in church, fought in the Battle of Atlanta, fought um, in the Diamond Nationals, good friends with my friend Sonny Ono. Eric at one point in time ran World Championship Wrestling, WCW. Very, very bright man. In reality, this week he's going into the uh, WWE Hall of Fame. But Eric wrote a book uh, called Controversy Creates Cash. And one thing he says in the book is that in dealing with um, similar entities, you can be the same as, less than, or different than. So with WKC USA, I wanted to be a little bit different. I wanted to be different than, I wanted to promote the whole idea of being part of this huge team that's going to go and compete. And that means that I'm not competing with NASCA. I'm not competing with these other entities that may have a similar idea of philosophy, but aren't trying to really build a culture. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's, that's the difference. I love that. And WKC has absolutely built an excellent infrastructure for sport karate competition. And, and I love everything that you're saying about those uh, kind of between country rivalries. I remember uh, back when WKA was still around before it became WKU, I competed in the WKA. That was the first world championship that I won. Uh, and I went because it was going to be down in Orlando. So my family from Kentucky, my family and I just took a road trip, went to Disney World. Right. And uh, so we went down to Orlando and I remember the, uh, the final and I was somebody that had really want anything yet i had uh i think i had just in like the month before i was on stage at diamonds for traditional forms but nobody knew me as a, as a bow staff guy yet i hadn't done anything with a bow yet um you know I, I competed in it but i just wasn't very good at it yet as far as i knew and um wk or wka canada that team at the time uh which i think mike bernardo had a leadership role in at the time was yeah, john ran that that's yeah. where they came from yeah, they had a bow powerhouse. And then from what somebody was telling me that was on the, the Team USA with me, they were like, Canada has won this weapons division for like the past five years. And this kid that's in your final has won it for the past three himself. And I'm like, uh, okay. So we go to the gold medal final and it's me and three Canadians, two of them doing bow, one of them doing sword. Um, me and the two other bow guys tie for the gold medal. And it's a dead mathematical tie. So we got to run our forms over again. Um, and then I ultimately wind up, you know, winning, winning the gold medal. What was crazy was, though, where the rivalry comes into play is uh, 2009. It was in Spain and I went to Spain to try to defend my gold medal and everything. And I won again and I got booed on the podium in Spain by the Canadians. The Canadians came all the way to Spain and then were brewing me on the podium for winning the weapons division. But, but that's, that's an example of how great these, and that's as a competitor, I love that. I love getting booed, made me want to go and win another gold medal. Right. So, you know, the, that inter country right. rivalry is, is so deep and especially in forms and weapons wait, between wait, Canada and the USA. Go ahead. What you just described, you see, John and Mike, have had their situation in place for 30 years or more, mm -hmm. right? So they went from WKA to creating the WKC using the same format. So mm -hmm. you go to Canada and their situation is super strong. From here, I had to build from scratch and also competing with the other entities and trying to draw people in. So one of my, one of my crowning moments, um, Jackson, was taking a, uh, gold, silver, and bronze in a few different forms of divisions for the Americans that hadn't been done before, right? But we, you know, with kids, we had kids sweep the divisions. And that, as I sit back as the president, you know, I'm smiling to myself going, <laughs> yeah, we have something here. But that's, but, that, but that's really, really, really what it's all about. And we, we banter with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, the presidents behind the scenes, we, we, we do a little, little bit of uh, stuff talking, so yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all. And one thing that was so cool about that Canada rivalry that I had was that Bernardo is the head of my training lineage, right? Bernardo That's trained right. Casey, Casey trained Lauren, Lauren trained me. So in a way, like Bernardo is responsible for, for me ever coming around in a way, you know what I mean? But anyway, so now we're talking about WKC specifically. I know there's a bunch of competitors that tune in and watch the show. So for any competitors watching, 
Why should they go and do WKC? What is it that makes it special for the competitors? We've talked about competing against other countries. We've talked about how special that is and being able to, to have a country behind you and supporting you as you try to go win a gold medal. But kind of make your pitch to the competitors. Why is WKC the annual world championships to compete in? Because I believe that that element is an integral part of sport karate because the other a lot of the other leagues you compete all year and then you went off points or you compete all year and then you use your points to go compete in a final like a super grands for nbl right but i think that these annual world championships that you qualify and compete for are integral to what sport karate is today so what is the pitch to competitors watching why should they go to wkc i think that if they're looking for um competition international competition at the highest level the opportunity to represent your country, have the national anthem played when you get your gold medal, gives you chills, mm -hmm. right? I say that from personal experience. Mm -hmm. So th th those elements and the camaraderie that you develop when you have that whole national situation. I'll tell you, Jackson, a couple of years ago when we had the um, WKC World Championships in Florida, we had over 300 members for the United States team, right? And just to hear them chanting USA, USA, it's like it's like no other, you know? So be, the, the children and the adults get to compete in the same world championship. Mm -hmm. So you can feed off of that as well. And then the whole family atmosphere, those opening ceremonies, when you're walking in and, and, and the various countries are being announced and doing their cheering, doing their chanting, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's wonderful. And it's something, you know, I have competitors in my environment that that's what they look forward to. You know, they look forward to that level of camaraderie, that level of, you know, it being special, representing your country, being able to hear your national anthem play when you get that gold medal. And it gives you, it gives you a significant goal. Right. Yeah, that is so special. And I, and I agree with you, you know, for, for our audience coming from somebody who's not the president of WKC USA, I've got a ton of students that I send to compete in WKC, because I think it's awesome. I think it's a great way to get that. One of them just experience. emailed me. <laughs> yes, sir. I got an email from one of the students recently. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of those emails that get sent are about questions about the rules and things of that nature, which brings me to another point. I love some of the WKC rules. And in particular, one thing that will shock a lot of our viewers I love the creative weapons rule that you can't release the weapon. Anybody that's watched me do a bow form knows that I love throwing my bow around, right? But I love the rule that you can't release the weapon because it forces a different style of creativity, something that we don't see all the time. Um, and it, it's not just, you know, I hear sometimes people compare it to like, well, that's kind of like NASCAR traditional weapons, right? Because it's all striking, but you can put it together however you want. I'm like, no, 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 no. You got to find a way to work within the rules, right? Because you can still do passes of the weapon from one hand to the other, high speed figure eights behind the back passes with the commas. You can do little manipulations and grip switches as long as the as long as the weapon doesn't leave the control of your hand, right? So talk a little bit about that. Were you were you a, a big part in that rule being created, or what do you like about that rule? Just tell us about where that rule comes from because I love. It. I wasn't part of that um, that rule being created, as you said. You know, Mike Bernardo is our weapons expert, so to speak. So he put touches of his own personal experience into it. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the the releases, what you do, it's fantastic. It's it's phenomenal. But creating, as you said, another skill set, being able to control the weapon and have constant control of the weapon while still being creative with it. Is, 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 is a skill in and of itself. So, you know, to, to, to have the two clash is not cool. So you have one, one group that can do one set of things, another group that's adept at doing another set of things, and then you have some who can cross over. But mm -hmm. encouraging that level of flexibility is what we're trying to do and what's important. It's much like, it's much like um, extreme forms versus creative forms. You know, there should be a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's one thing that's been a hot topic of conversation recently is the fact that a lot of times 
people take their creative forms and they try to make it look as much like extreme as they can so that they have a chance when they go to the, the grands, the runoffs or whatever, they've got a chance against those extreme competitors. But that's another debate for another day. Now I want to go ahead and move on to, we've talked about WKC one more time. Any competitors watching, go check it out. I highly recommend it. Please support the WKC. WKCAmerica.com. WKCAmerica.com. Absolutely. Go on over to that website, check it out, read their rules. They've got a great thing going over there. So I really hope that everybody that's watching this goes over and, uh, and checks out that website. So now we're going to move on to kind of, to me, you've got like these three major things that you've contributed so much to sport karate, your career as a competitor, WKC USA, and also a legendary coaching career, right? And you are the coach of Team Impex. So let's start, kind of take us back. What's the origin story of Team Impex, sponsored by Impex and Jason Chen, of course, who is an extremely influential figure in sport karate history, right? And a lot of people don't know his name because he kind of stays behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, but absolutely somebody that, that deserves some credit. Uh, so tell us about the, the inception of Team Impex. Well, let me go back for a minute. You know, um, I was part of some significant teams. And at the helm of those teams were some awesome individuals. Mm -hmm. So they may not have known when I was paying attention and listening, but in addition to wanting to compete, I had students that I wanted to influence and help get better. So, you know, with, with the very first sponsored team ever in the history of Spoke Karate, the Budweiser team in 1985, you know, Ed Parker was our, was our advisor mm -hmm. and then Chuck Merriman was brought on as our coach. And for those of you that don't know Chuck Merriman, he is a martial arts god in America, right? Um, Co coach Merriman, not, he wasn't someone who would sit back and tell you, okay, throw this reverse punch, this, and the other. One, he knew the rules inside and out. And two, he was one heck of a motivator. Mm -hmm. So I got, I, I picked up things from him. Another person I consider a, a dear friend, he just just had hip replacement surgery, so pray for him. Jackson's coach, my former coach, Don Rodriguez, fantastic, right? I can sit back and call Don on the phone and get all kinds of advice whenever it takes place. And we have we have consistent dialogue. So I learned from him. So as part of the Paul Mitchell team, I got older and um, we had a local guy here who owned a company who decided he wanted to sponsor a karate team, SES, right? Mm -hmm. So he contacted me and I called Don. I said, Don, I have a, the, the opportunity to coach, coach a team. And he gave me his blessings, gave me his support. Now, you know, myself and Mike Conroy, I, I'm sure Mike would agree. Our, back then anyway, we thought that our ultimate coaching position would be to coach Paul Mitchell. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, 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 imagine Morgan and Avery in that black and white, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not opposed to that. That can still happen. But anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I, I coached Team SES. Uh, that's when we were strong in the NBL. And then the, the company went under. I was dormant for a minute. Then Garth Benz asked me to coach Team Victory. So we did Team Victory. And while doing Team Victory, Jason Chen and I started communicating some. And Jason had one team and he had a vision to have a few different teams to help get his products out, right? So with one team, we can go only this far, but if he starts sponsoring a multitude of teams, then his reach could be greater. Mm -hmm. So Team Impex was the second of his sponsored teams, but then All-Stars left. So we became the only team. And with that, you know, I sat back and I looked and Avery was coming up, Morgan was coming up, both of them had done well with, with Garth's team victory. And so I picked up the phone and I called Jody Tension. And I said, look, you sitting here, at, that, at this point in time, believe it or not, Jody had an MMA fight schedule. Wow. And um, I talked him out of doing that and coming over with uh, uh, Impact. Ross Levine had just left full circle. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people thought that we, encouraged him to leave. No, Ross left on his own, right? This was even before Impex was, was, was formed. So mm -hmm. Ross came over and then Troy Benz joined us and we had a powerhouse of a team. Oh yeah. You know, um, and, and, and things just, things just kind of went on from there. Again, as you said, with, with Jason's support, Jody retired and Verona Solomon and Jason Grenier came aboard. Mm -hmm. Solid. 
right? Those are two solid people. They're underrated in my estimation because both of, them, both, both of them phenomenal. So, you know, we, um, we were able to put together a really strong squad. Mm -hmm. And Jason in particular, he was a huge part of some of y'all's biggest team fighting wins. I remember multiple times where Jason would step in and he was a matchup that people didn't really expect. And Jason would swing the fight in your favor. And then I think in a lot of cases, Avery was fighting the anchor and then Avery could finish the job, right? Speaking of Avery, now I know that as a dad this whole time, you want to talk about the kids, right? So really. first talk, <laughs> let's first mention, you know, obviously two of the, the biggest uh, stars on Team Impex right now are one of, if not the best heavyweight men's fighters in the world, Avery, your son, as well as arguably the greatest, definitely one of the greatest female fighters in the world right now, period, and your daughter, Morgan. So just first talk about coaching them and how special that's been bringing them up. It, it, it's been an interesting journey, Jackson, because um, I tell people I didn't want either one of them to do this, mm. right? Morgan was a standout all-star pitcher, mm -hmm. right? She 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 was all Metro, all city. Um, pitched her first year at D1 um, at Howard University. Uh, there was some dynamics there with the team, and she called us up one day and said, "I want to come home. Don't want to play softball anymore." I'll get my degree at home and I want to start competing in tournaments. And you know, what, what am I going to say? <laughs> I had to embrace that. But prior to that, any during softball season and so on and so forth, she couldn't, I wouldn't let her do martial arts. I didn't want her to hurt her finger, you know, twist a knee or anything like that. And she was a pitcher. So that's of course, very important, uh, very important position on the team. With Avery, we tried him at everything. Both of them, we tried tennis. We tried track. I'm a big track and field fan. Mm -hmm. So we tried, we tried track. Um, Avery, we put in football, always coming back to karate. Mm -hmm. And whereas Morgan was, um, has always been a good athlete, Avery, not so much. Avery's more like his dad's kid. <laughs> so, you know, neither, neither one of us were, were standout athletes, so to speak. But both of them have such determination that from a coaching standpoint, I don't have to say much. Um, Avery is quick to say, and Jody says this too, because Jody uh, is, is not shy about talking about my influence and his sport karate career. They'll say they're the only ones that really listen, right? Now I've had some great students. I've been fortunate, you know, Willie Hicks has won a lot. Jermon Wiggins has won a lot. Askia Allison won a lot. I had guys in my, who, who grew up under me in my camp who've done well, but um, Jody and Avery say, They've never talked back, never asked me any questions. You know, I just say, okay, do this, and they do it. I have another guy that I coach named Brian Plumper mm -hmm. and with, with SES. And Brian was, when, when I picked Brian up, he was 230. When he showed up at our first tournament, he was 205. That told me a lot, right, right away. And Brian was the type of guy that if I said, Brian, eat a bowl of dog food before you fight, Brian would do it. <laughs> never I mean just follow follow the script and that's the thing because being on the outside you can see things that people on the inside necessarily can't see when they're fighting mm -hmm. so you can give them you can give them some pointers some influence and then just from the standpoint of, of training what to do you know it's my philosophy that it is a sin to get tired sparring mm -hmm. that's a sin that shouldn't happen because that means you're not prepared so, you know, you get your cardio together, you get your strength training in, and then you also do your drills and things. So many of the people in our environment, Jackson, spend so much time sparring that they're not working to get better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not doing drills. So, you know, I, my thing is like 80% everything else, maybe 20%, maybe even 15% sparring. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've been able to follow those scripts and, that you know, they love it. Plus, one more quick thing, as juniors, I didn't bring them out to a lot of major tournaments. Mm -hmm. I spoon fed them. We do the AKA because I love John Sharkey. I love the what, what the AKA has been able to do for me as an organization and as an event. So we've always gone to the AKA Grand Nationals, but you know, I spoon feed, spoon fed them tournaments. And so now that they're adults, they want to go. And now they now they've been on in quarantine. We haven't had any tournaments really. I'm really interested in seeing, knowing what their fitness level is like right now, I'm really interested in seeing what they're going to be like. 
they're going to be hungry. And I love that. I cannot wait to see both of them in the ring uh, tearing through those brackets to get to overall grand championships. You said something really interesting and yeah, knock on wood. Um, now you said something really interesting about being in the coach's chair and seeing things that the fighter themselves can't see as the fight is going on. And I've heard fighters tell me before, some of them drown out their coach when they're fighting. Some of them are only kind of listening between rounds as if a two round fight for grands, things of that nature. Um, and so in your experience, and we also see different coaches, right we see some coaches that are more so motivators and spend more of their time in the fight yelling to you know just work harder or not lose the cardio or whatever right so from your perspective how important is what is going on in that coach's chair and you mentioned how well morgan and avery listen um how much has that been able to play a role in the adjustments that they make mid-fight because that's a part of the game that i think a lot of people especially spectators don't understand is that relationship between the person in the coaching chair and the fighter on the mat and you said, um, you know, some, some coaches are motivators. Jackson, it is rare if you ever hear me in a coach's chair raise my voice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because I'm, my, my fighters are already emotional. So I'm not going to try to increase that level of emotion by screaming and yelling, so on and so forth. And those that are close to me tell me that they, they can drown everyone else out, but they can hear my voice. And it's just little subtle things that you can say that help um, you know, get, them, get them together, so to speak. Punching side, okay, that's the punching side. Okay, that's the kicking side. Okay, they're about to do this. Okay, they're about to do that. And they pick up on it, or you, or you mentioned to them something. Um, you know, we have different code words for different things that I just might throw a code word out of sorts, and then they can respond to that. So it, 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 we, we all have our different, um, our different models for success. As far as that goes, our different approaches, but mine is just to be, if, if I raise my voice, I'm really trying to get a point across and then they know, oh Lord, the world is going to end, <laughs> that's what's going on. And even in training, you know, you have to have different approaches to folks. I've never, I've never raised my voice to Morgan and coach because she'll shut down, right? If I start yelling at her, she's boom. I know my daughter's personality, you know, whereas Avery, if I say a couple of strong words, he gets the message, you know? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's different personalities, different ways to different personalities. Very interesting. And so now going back to Morgan and Avery, one thing, this is just for fun, but I think I can kind of tell what the answer might be based on what you were saying about their athletic careers previously. When they started training seriously full-time, who was the more naturally gifted fighter? Was it Morgan or Avery? Well, I'll tell you this. Morgan hated fighting. Hmm. In, in, in the school as an underbelt, Morgan may have gone six to 12 months without sparring at all. She wow. came to me one day and she said, I don't, I don't wanna fight. I don't like it. And you know, again, you have to be able to separate being parent and being instructor. I had a rule in my house where we didn't talk martial arts at home, right? And they would want to, mm -hmm. would show some level of hunger, but I'd be like, no, I wanna be dad. You know, let's talk, let's talk about something else. I don't want to bring the karate school home with us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th th that, that was a particular rule. But um, I would say that, that Morgan was the more natural athlete. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Morgan had the successes earlier. Um, her, her first win was um, Charlie Lane's event down at Daytona. Mm -hmm. Gator Nationals. Uh, pardon? Yeah, the Gators. Excuse me. Well, a, a couple of months before, we had gone to America and she lost her first fight, just nerves and this, that, and the other. But, you know, by that time, I knew I had something special as far as my daughter goes. I just knew based on her work ethic and, and her athleticism. So we went to America and she lost, and I wasn't worried about it. She was down on herself. And then the next event that May, we showed up at the Gator Nationals. Nobody knew who she was. No, you know, she was just another person out here and she won grand. You know, and, and she came out of the ring and she told me, she said, wow, this is huge. <laughs> and I was like, yes, sweetheart, that's huge. Now, married of grand championships later, you know, it's a, it's a whole different level. But yeah, that, that was it for her. For Avery, it was, it was a little more of a struggle for the light bulb to come on. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, everybody can kick and punch, right? But it's really understanding the scientific aspects of the game that we play. So 
you you know, as an instructor, you have a variety of different students. You know, again, I mentioned a Jermon Wiggins. Jermon Wiggins could kick like, my God, <laughs> Jermon could kick. But Jermon didn't fight like Willie Hicks. Both of them coming up at the same classes, same thing, but they, they understood what you do and what you don't do. They understood timing, distance, technique. They understood how to set back and set up change-ups with the kids, you know, broken rhythm, um, angles of attack and things like that. Those are the things that we teach that are universal concept that anybody, regardless of your physical makeup, should be able to do. For sure. Now, I've got another fun one, okay? So we're going to play some fantasy sport karate. If you could take Avery and you could take Morgan and you could send them back in time just for one grand championship fight, to see them fight somebody from your era or any of the older eras, right? Who would you want to see each of them fight just for pure entertainment to see how they would match up with them? Um, it's, it's, well, for, for, well, <laughs> for, 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 for Avery, I would say Steve Nasty Anderson, mm -hmm. because Steve, again, to me, was the best of my era. The guy went a year and a half without losing would do anything to win. And, um, you know, thank God both Avery and Morgan got a chance to go to dinner with Steve and listen to his philosophies. And then Steve sent Avery um, a list of about 10 things that every champion must do from, from Steve's heart, right? And so, you know, that, that, that would be fantastic. And then for Morgan, um, I would think of two, to be honest with you. One being Linda Denley, mm -hmm. who again was the best tournament fighter of my era, who I love dearly, teammate, so on and so forth. And then Nikki Carlson, mm -hmm. Nikki Carlson Lee. What a phenomenal fighter she was. Again, someone who doesn't quite get the praise that she deserves, but N Nikki Carlson Lee was one heck of a woman fighter and also had the right kind of demeanor you know, she was Brian Plimple's instructor, her and her husband, Rick Lee, and just her demeanor, her professionalism, wonderful people, man. Mm -hmm. I should have said it before, because that was going to be my prediction for Morgan's matchups, was either going to be Linda Denley or Nikki Carlson Lee. And Nikki <laughs> Carlson Lee, I believe, has the record for the most diamond, diamond ring wins by any single competitor, which that is, is absolutely win. insane. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Yeah, so definitely some great history there. I would love to see those. I think about that all the time because obviously it would it would never happen because it's impossible. But like if I could go back, because for me, right, it's like if I could go back and compete in the Bernardo era and not obviously I wouldn't be doing my style that I do now back then because it would never win. They would be like too much tricks, not karate, whatever. Right. But being able to compete just against him and have that experience would be incredible. And even like the close generations for me, right? Like I never got a chance to compete against Calvin and I would have loved that. I never got a chance to compete in a division with Matt. I competed against Matt in a weapons battle. I competed against Matt in sync, but I never got to go in a ring with Matt and run a division, right? And so th those are things that it's, man, I, I wish I was just older, you know what I mean? But um, anyway, so yeah, definitely. You're still, you're still young, that time machine might come in your time. So. <laughs> that would be awesome. So uh, now next thing that we're gonna get to We've got, you know, the Plowden family, right? Yourself, Avery, Morgan, even Travis. I mean, you guys have a big history of having great point fighters, whether it's, you know, Team Paul Mitchell members and Travis and yourself. And obviously there's Morgan and Avery who have, be, who have won countless overall grand championships, right? If you had to wrap it up into a couple of things, what would you say is the Plowden family secret? What has made it all possible? Hard work. Mm -hmm. I think that that, you know, our, our work ethic could never be questioned. And coming um, as, a, as a martial artist from the 70s, when martial arts instructors were little nuts <laughs> and uh, adapting some of that craziness, you know, um, and in imparting that into my training philosophy, because Jack, I'm, I'm not as crazy now as I used to be. And some of my old time students let me know that, oh, you've gotten soft. So it's like, no, not necessarily soft, but more sophisticated and a little bit smarter. But um, it, it's, it's, you know, the dictionary is the only place where success comes before work. And you have to be willing to sacrifice and work hard in order to accomplish your goals, regardless of what they are. You know, passion is something that you can't buy in the bottle. 
So you have to find what your passion is. For whatever reason, so much of the Plowden family passion has revolved around uh, martial arts. You, you, you talk about Travis and what he's doing with this podcast and this martial arts inter-network and things, and now he's drawing his brother, Eugene, into it. So, you know, um, and, and Eugene is, is, is here in Detroit teaching, doing, doing some amazing things with that. So it, it's, but, but there are no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be done right and you have to be willing to sacrifice. So many people, they don't want to pay their dues and they don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to hurt. And you have to, you, you have to be willing to hurt. It's not going to happen overnight and you're going to have peaks and valleys. You just can't build a house when you're in the valley. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. That is awesome. I, I need to clip that. We need to share that everywhere. <laughs> that's a great closing message there. I'm um, talking about truly one of, if not the greatest family legacies in the history of sport karate, right up there with the, the Nash family. And, you know, there's others we can talk about, but I mean, the Plowden family legacy, go ahead. No, no, no. Trevor, Casey, Chelsea Nash were part of the vision. I, I remember um, Morgan and Avery competing. They didn't win grands together or whatever. So I said, they didn't pull off a Nash yet. Right. So that, that, that's what I termed it, a Nash. So now they pulled off a Nash winning multiple grand championships at the same time. So great point. I love it. That is awesome. So Mr. Plowden, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been incredible. Uh, it's everything I could have dreamed of for this podcast and more. Audience, if you enjoyed this show, go ahead, drop those hearts. And most importantly, share, share, share. If you enjoyed this episode, hit that share button. Go ahead, post it up on your feed so all of your friends can see it. And if you've got any questions or any topics for debate, go ahead, drop those down in the comments so we see that as well. Mr. Plowden, one more time, thank you so much. Any last words as we're about to sign off here? I, I just want to thank you, Jackson, because as I, I told you when we chatted, you know, I'm an addict, right? If there, was a, if there was a sport karate rehab, my behind would be there, and I think you'd probably be in the room over. So, you know, we, we have issues, but you've indulged me this Friday morning, and I thank you so much. Thank those of you who took time to listen. If you have any questions or any comments for me too, please put them in the chat reach out. I have issues. I love this stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm addicted to this stuff as well. And that's why the Jack's Rudolph podcast is going to keep coming back every week. We're getting more guests. We're getting better guests. I don't know if we're going to get much better than Richard Plowden, but we're going to keep trying to. So once again, thank you so much, Mr. Plowden, for your time. Thank you to everybody that tuned in. This has been episode 62 of the Jack's Rudolph podcast, and I'll see you next time.